Hello and welcome to today's episode of Beef Talks brought to you by Chagask in association with the Irish Farmers Journal and sponsored by FPD Trust. I'm Lorcan Allen, Agribusiness Editor with the Irish Farmers Journal and on today's show we're going to be discussing sustainability in Irish farming. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr Paul Crossan, Beef Enterprise Leader in Chagask Grange and Professor Sinead Waters, Principal Research Officer at Chagask Grange. I'll also be joined later in the show by Dr. John Finn, uh, Biodiversity and Ecology Researcher at Chagas Johnstown Castle. Paul, if I can start with you, we're hearing a lot uh, of discussion uh, at the minute about sustainability in our food production systems. I mean, maybe just give us your, your, your feel for, for, for that, uh, for, for food production. Well, I suppose, Larkin, it's, it's, it's a very, I suppose, commonly used term now, the whole issue of sustainability. And maybe in some respects, it's an overused and maybe abused term uh, as well. Uh, and can mean many things to, to many people. Um, I suppose we can range from economic sustainability to social sustainability to environmental sustainability. And I suppose in, in terms of food production, what we're really referring to is the, the, the ability to meet the needs of today's society to produce safe and nutritious food without compromising the future needs to produce safe and nutritious food. So it's about being sustainable in all respects of food production. Uh, I suppose in terms of, of, of the various elements of it, economic sustainability, and most of this week we've referred to essentially economic sustainability, uh, and we have a major focus on that on, on Friday and on Friday's Beef Talk and throughout the day on Friday. And, and really from a food production point of view, that means, you know, are all links in the supply chain sustainable? Uh, and as we know, um, probably the farm sector and the farm link is the one that is most at risk from a sustainability point of view. Social sustainability, really from a food production point of view, means, you know, are we producing food in a manner, in a manner that society uh, accepts? So is it an acceptable way of food production? And that might refer to animal welfare, uh, antimicrobial usage, or a host of other issues. And, and I suppose today, and, and today's focus uh, throughout the entire virtual beef uh, day today, uh, is environmental sustainability, essentially. Uh, and that, again, can mean a number of different things depending on, on one's perspective. Uh, it can be water quality, uh, the whole issue of land use, land degradation, um, land use change indeed, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, ammonia emissions and so on. So there are a host of issues uh, in relation to environmental sustainability. And I suppose the two that are foremost and with good reason uh, in, in society's mind at the moment is greenhouse gas emissions, uh, number one, uh, and the whole issue of biodiversity. Well, you mentioned greenhouse gas emissions there from agriculture. I mean, we regularly hear that uh, cattle, beef cattle, dairy cattle are major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we also hear that Irish beef and dairy production is among the most sustainable in the world. How do you explain that uh, apparent kind of contradiction there? Yeah, and, and it can sometimes be a little bit confusing when, when we're faced with those two uh, concepts, if you like. Uh, on the one hand, the agricultural and agri-food sector in Ireland is responsible for about a third of total emissions. You know, so compared to the EU average of about 10 or just shy of 10%. So, you know, in terms of total emissions generated, uh, it's a, it's, it has a high proportion. Um, but I suppose it's a little bit like, you know, I think it's only half the story, you know, and I often think it's a little bit like saying that maybe, you know, you use twice as much fuel coming here today as I used. That really is only half the story. It depends how far you travelled. You know, if you travel three times as far or four times as far, then you might actually be more efficient in your, in your efficiency of travel. So from a food production point of view, really, we have to look beyond simply total emissions. It has to be emissions per unit of food produced. And essentially what we're referring to there is the carbon footprint. Uh, and when we look at carbon footprint from, a, from an agri-food perspective, and particularly from a beef perspective, uh, Irish beef, the Irish beef sector has one of the lowest carbon uh, footprints in the world. If we look firstly within a European or a global context, uh, European beef production is very efficient compared to international comparators. And that really is because we don't have the same land use change emissions associated with us as other regions, for example, South America. But even more importantly, I know land use sometimes hugs the headlines, if you like, but even more importantly is the whole issue of methane emissions. And I know Sinead's going to refer to that a little bit later. But if we compare European food production with other uh, parts of the world, it's really around methane and how reproductively efficient the European beef sector is, how efficient from a live weight perspective. If you compare European beef production, you know, calving at 
sort of between two and three or two two years of age and thirty months. Much of the world are calving at three years of age and slaughtering at three to four years of age. You know, so we're much more efficient in that respect. Then within Europe, if you look at Irish beef production, uh, we are among the lowest producers or lowest carbon footprints within Europe. So in other words, we're among the lowest of a region that is the lowest uh, in the world from a, a carbon footprint perspective. Okay. And so despite like the relatively low carbon footprint of Irish agriculture, it still accounts for a very large share of our overall national emissions. And we, and we know that we have targets. Uh, so, so does it not make sense then in that regard to, to cut our national herd in terms of the amount of cattle we have and the emissions associated with them? Yeah, look, it's, it's a good question. And it's one that is, I suppose, asked quite a bit at the moment. Um, and I suppose it depends what one wants to achieve. You know, if we, if we want to, you know, the question needs to be, will that reduce global emissions? Will reducing the Irish national herd reduce global emissions? We've already identified that, you know, I, the, the, the carbon footprint of Irish beef is amongst the lowest in the world. And, you know, if, if we then look at the global emissions perspective, we would have to say that reducing the national herd will only support the global effort to curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions if global demand for beef reduces. Otherwise, all we're doing is stimulating production in other regions where emissions are higher. Uh, and if we look at projections for beef production, look at OECD, FAO type figures, we're currently producing, or the current consumption is around 70 million tonnes or thereabouts. The projections are by the end of this decade, uh, we'll be closer to 80 million tonnes. So we are seeing a growing demand for, for beef. Uh, and in that context, reducing the national herd and thereby stimulating demand elsewhere could have the perverse effect of actually increasing total emissions. So I think we do need to accept that we have to reduce emissions. There are you know, government targets, EU targets, uh, to reduce emissions. We have to try and address that. Uh, we have to look at you know, indirect ways of doing that. In other words, being more efficient and therefore diluting our emissions over greater quantities of beef. Uh, we have to look at direct ways of reducing emissions. And that's the abatement technologies around methane and uh, around nitrous oxide. And Chagas is doing a lot of research in, in those areas. And of course, we also have to look at you know, meat consumption globally. Uh, can we, you know, in parts of the world, we know that meat consumption and red meat consumption is very high. Uh, can we take steps to, to address that? So I think it's a multifaceted approach from a Chagas perspective as a, as a knowledge-based organization. Uh, we're focusing on the efficiency part of the, of the story and trying to reduce emissions per unit of beef produced. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to sum up there, Paul, what you're saying is that national targets are important for greenhouse gases, but when it comes to something like food, where it's such a globally interconnected system, uh, taking a global perspective is often very important in terms of where is the most efficient place to, to, to produce beef and meat. Um, thanks for your contribution, Paul. It's really interesting. Um, we're going to talk now about biodiversity. Uh, and earlier uh, this week, I was joined by Dr. John Fain of Ch Chagas Johnstown Castle to talk about biodiversity in Irish farming. Thanks for joining me, John. Um, I, we're here today. We're going to talk a little bit about biodiversity uh, in Irish agriculture and on Irish farms. We've heard a huge amount about biodiversity and habitats on, on farmland in the news recently. Why, why is this? Yeah, thanks, Larkin. Um, yeah, well, we've, we've heard an awful lot of, uh, and there's been an awful lot of talk about biodiversity more recently. Um, I mean, farmers have always been interested in, in biodiversity. And whenever we visited farms, farms, you know, farmers are always very knowledgeable about habitats on their farms and most often take great pride in them. But the issue's begun a lot more global uh, recently with uh, lots of examples of species extinctions and habitat removal. And there's uh, quite a serious extinction event uh, globally at the moment, a concern about that, with many, many species and habitats disappearing at a much faster rate than ever before. Um, in Ireland, at a national scale, we're, we're seeing some examples of that as well. And in the, the jewels of the crown, that would be the Natura 2000 network of special protection areas and special areas of conservation, for example. Even there, we're seeing that quite a few of those habitats are failing to meet the uh, target standards of, of habitat quality that they're expected to meet. When we go out into the wider countryside, um, there's less systematic monitoring, but we also know from farmland bird surveys that those have been declining quite considerably over the last few decades. And even with our farmland bees and um, wild bees, we see about a third of them threatened with extinction. I guess, um, you know, but many farms in Ireland especially still have quite a few habitats and quite a, few, quite a bit of habitat area 
remaining on the farm. And every farmer can do something. And there's quite a lot that can be done to reverse those declines and restore uh, nature on farms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've well, got some examples. Sorry, we've got some examples of those different types of farm habitats from uh, the Bride Project, Blown for Moy. Yeah, so we're, we're just going to cut to a short video here now with um, my colleague in the Farmers Journal, Shane Murphy, and he speaks to Chagas's Darrow Hulakon and Bill O'Keefe, just talking about the Bride project, project down in Cork and some of the examples uh, of how they're working to preserve habitats and increase biodiversity on farms. I'm joined here with Bill O'Keefe down his farm in Bellino, down in East Cork. Why did you join the Bride Project? Um, we're a mixed... Um dairy and beef farm here and uh, we, we went to the first meetings and we like uh, we were always interested in the environment and stuff like that but uh, this really tweaked our interest and we could see things that can be done. What are some of the things you did in the scheme? Um, we are planting um, a multi-species hedge, hedgerow, um, we are putting in a pond which um, we've already done and we move out some of the wires from the ditches, like to leave the hedgerow grow a bit and leave the f leave it flower for the summer. Just behind us here, we've got one of your hedgerows. I, I suppose, what's the different practices now compared to what it was a few years ago before you joined the scheme? Before we joined the scheme, that hedgerow would have been cut down to probably eight or 10 feet high um, and manicured every year or every two years. Whereas nowadays, we just cut the sides of it and leave the rest of it flower, like, you know, so. As you see there, that hedgerow is flowering at the moment, and that's 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 what you want. Like you know, you need that stuff to for the birds and the bees, and that's what keeps the biodiversity going. Do you think intensive farming can run alongside protecting our environment? I think it can, and I think it actually has to. Like you know, there is there is going to be no choice there. Um, you see all over the world, like where over intensification is causing trouble. And if you don't decide to work with the environment, it's going to bite you, like, you know, it, you, and it, it can be done, you know, it's, it's as simple as that, like, it just depends on your mindset, you know. So I, I have no problem with it, yeah. It doesn't affect your production much, like, you know, so it's actually nearly easier to do because you just leave it alone, <laughs> <laughs> in actual fact. Yeah. Joined here with Dara O'Hulligan, uh, Tagus Research Officer in Biodiversity. Um, tell us a small bit about what you've learned so far from the Braid Scheme, and. Is this something that can be rolled out nationally? Yeah, there are very, thanks Shane, there are very important lessons that can be learned from projects such as this, the Bride project here down in East Cork. I think the message of retaining existing habitat is a very important message and start valuing existing habitats, even those habitats that are not currently eligible under single farm payments such as scrub or such as pond as we've seen here earlier. The other main message I think is coming out is in relation to, as Bill said, the results-based approach to schemes. I think it's only fair if farmers improve the quality of their habitat that they should be rewarded to do so. So if they're given advice on how to manage hedgerows or field margins or ponds to improve the quality from a biodiversity point of view, they're, they're incentivized and are paid to do so. Okay, so a really interesting snapshot there, John, in terms of the work that's going on down in the Bride Project uh, with farmers working hand in hand with, 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 with yourselves. Um, in terms of biodiversity, you know, how do you include it in um, assessments of, of farming sustainability and, and how, why should it be included and how can it be included uh, in your view? Yeah, so, you know, the sustainability of agriculture um, is, is a, a topic of global interest at the moment. And we've made huge progress in the last few years in methods to measure sustainability, and especially in terms of carbon and gaseous emissions and issues related to climate change. Most uh, sustainability uh, measurements and benchmarks would include, you know, in addition to, to climate change issues or gaseous emissions, water quality, soil health, uh, animal welfare, human welfare, but also biodiversity. So biodiversity is considered a real key pillar of measurement of, of sustainability. And we need to be careful that any measurement of sustainability that doesn't include biodiversity would, would really have a lot of doubt about how, how um, accurate that measurement is. Um, from a, a point of view of ag the agri-food industry, an awful lot of multinational companies now have sustainability charters, which include all of these metrics, including biodiversity. So look into the future as we try and quantify agricultural sustainability more and more. We will need to include uh, an aspect of biodiversity in these assessments. 
And those multinationals are benchmarking themselves against international benchmarking standards, which themselves also include biodiversity. So this is going to become more and more of an issue. Uh, our work in Chagask has been trying to uh, figure out ways of doing this. I mean, traditionally, assessments of, of farm habitats would require field by field or farm by farm approaches, which is simply, you, you know, there's far too many farms and far too many fields to be doing an approach like that. What we're trying to do is use technology and use aerial imagery and hopefully in the future and, and the not so far future satellite imagery to substitute people going, visiting far, individual farms to doing these uh, approaches remotely. And I've got some examples here of the outputs of this kind of approach where we're using aerial imagery to map farms. So develop a farm map that's color coded to particular types of habitats. Uh, uh, estimate the area of each of those habitats from the map and also provide these examples of photos from the farms that really give and, and bring to life the kinds of habitats that occur. So I've got one example here which comes from County Kerry and it, you know it really highlights how uh, we can give farmers credit for the habitats that they have on their farms. Uh, it's the second example from a, a more intensive farm and you can still see here you know, there's up to seven kilometers of hedgerow and quite a few bits of woodland and scrub and uh, other meadows that would have quite a bit of biodiversity associated with them. Okay, and, and like, I mean, it's, it's hugely topical, as you said, the government, the new government uh, proposing to uh, carry out a biodiversity census across the country to try and measure it. We're, we're going to cut to a little video here now where my colleague Adam Woods in the Farmer's Journal uh, speaks with Chagas's Catherine Keena, and they're kind of looking at different management approaches to maintaining uh, habitats and biodiversity on, on farms. I'm here with Catherine Keena, Countryside Management Specialist with Chagas, and we're here on an intensively managed derogation farm in County Waterford. Catherine, why should farmers concern themselves with biodiversity? We're concerned about biodiversity because it is in decline, both worldwide but also in Ireland. And I think it's important we have a fantastic image, a green image of our beef in Ireland. Farmers have the right to farm once they're within the legislation and according to any scheme rules that they're in. But if you have a farm that doesn't have the things we're going to talk about, we cannot also say it's good for biodiversity. Like on this farm, to prove biodiversity, we can plant small native woodlands or groves of trees like this. We can grow wild crops for wildlife, which are left unharvested to uh, during the winter to feed the seed eating birds or we can plant new hedgerows but before we create new habitats it's really important to look after our existing ones some farmers uh, are, have more fields than others so the biodiversity management practice index looks after the management of these linear features. Linear habitats are particularly important because they are widespread, they're on every farm. Uh, we're talking about hedgerows, watercourses and field margins and they not only are they habitats in themselves but they also link other habitats and they're corridors of movement for birds, bats, bees, mammals. They're really like networks of nature through our farming platform where farming and biodiversity can thrive side by side. Explain to me a couple of the key points in that index that you've developed. Yeah, the Chagas Biodiversity Management Practice Index considers the management of the linear habitats and there are four categories. The first one is the nature of our farming landscape. And the, the important question here is, is your average farm size under five hectares? Next is our hedgerows. Are they fit for birds and bees? And there are two criteria here. Are your hedgerows over one and a half metres above ground level in height? and that includes the bank so that birds will nest in them. And do they contain flowering trees for the bees? Next one is the field margins. When reseeding, do you leave at least 1.5 metres uncultivated? And do you spray in the field margin other than spot spraying noxious weeds? Finally, whether the nature of our watercourses is protected, do you uh, prevent livestock drinking access? Are your watercourse banks fenced? And do you allow a um, 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 watercourse margin of at least one and a half metres for biodiversity? 
These are the first eight things uh, we want a farmer to do, be, to consider, is he doing, to know that these are the, the, the most important eight best practices before we move on to creating new habitats. Tell me a little bit about the, the history of this little uh, grove. Yeah, just four years ago, um, a quarter of an acre, 0 0.09 of a hectare, was planted. Um, Stockproof fence, number one, very important. Uh, it was, uh, trenches were dug with a digger and the clay was mounded. So two metre trenches, the clay was mounded up and the trees planted along that uh, at one metre spacings. The trees were on top of the mound, gave them a height advantage above the vegetation at the time. The tree shelter certainly helped um, keep the vegetation away. And one year later, uh, it allowed uh, glyphosate to be sprayed along near the trees. Catherine, thanks very much for talking to us today. You're very welcome, Adam. Okay, John, a really interesting uh, snippet there, uh, a video from, from, from Adam and Catherine just talking about biodiversity and, and habitat, you know, and how to, 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 to management on farms and some techniques for farmers. Um, just to give us a sense, like, what do we know about nature, habitats, biodiversity levels on Irish farms today uh, uh, and beef farms? You know, where, where, where do we stand? Yeah, so I suppose at the at the larger scale, um, you, you know, there's quite a few beef systems that are very extensive and occur in the Chura 2000 area. So those um, those would be ex those would be occurring in the Chura 2000 areas, and some of them have issues. Um, that's for sure. They're not meeting their ecological targets, but many of them are, and they're also still outstanding examples of biodiversity remaining on those on those areas. As we look towards the rest of the country, some of our recent work has been looking at the distribution of uh, farms of high nature value farmland. And we can see here from a map of Ireland, you know, those dark green areas are the areas where we would expect the highest nature value to be occurring on farms. And in these areas, the target really is to maintain the, the high quality or to improve the high quality, improve the existing quality to achieve the highest standards of, of quality that's expected of these kinds of areas. Many of them would be outside the mature 2000 areas, and that's not always that's not always considered. And we actually have quite a large area of the country that is high nature value farmland. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, we've got a variety of farming systems, and the more intensive ones can also do something for biodiversity. And largely, the, our, our advice is the number one thing to do is retain the existing habitats. Um, take if some of those existing habitats aren't the highest quality improve their quality and then if there are very very low levels of, of habitats on farms do something to create new habitats and we've been looking at these issues of retaining enhancing and creating habitats again in cooperation with uh, with colleagues in, in Chagas. Okay, and, and we've actually got we've got a third video here that we're going to go back to the Bride Project in, in Cork and just look at some of the work that they're doing in terms of habitat protection. And we've got a video with a few examples of habitats in the Bride Project uh, and how results-based you know, uh, payments are used to actually incentivize farmers in the Bride Valley to, to improve uh, the quality of, of, of habitats in, in, in the area. One aspect of the Bride program is uh, retaining habitats. So just here behind us, we have one of them retained habitats. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that was originally uh, a bog that was reclaimed um, 40 years ago, but no part of it has gone back to being rewetted again. And that's that that wet rewetted area is a habitat, a habitat, and that's what we're we're, we're trying to retain those habitats. Like that's the idea of leaving it as it is. Okay, so we've talked about maintaining and retaining. I suppose talk to us about this plant behind us. What, what aspect of the scheme is this? Well, every farmer in the Bride Project is sort of encouraged to have a pond. Um, so ponds were sort of regular things in farms in times gone by, but there were a lot of them were filled in because they weren't eligible for um, single farm payments and stuff. So they're trying to get to people to put in ponds and it's a habitat that has gone missing and there are certain animals and things that it will in, um, encourage to come back into a place. And was there much work? No, that job, even though you, you think it was going to take a lot of time, that job took about two hours, you know? Right. It doesn't take a lot of time and it was all done very quickly. Is that self-rising then from below? Have you, did you hit the water base? No, there's actually a spring there, a very slow spring. 
and as the year goes on the water table here will rise like you know considering we've had a very dry spill it is amazing that there's so much water there already like they don't encourage it to be too fast flowing like because a pond has to be sort of half stagnant like i think we're seeing new legislation and new strategies coming from the eu in the last few weeks in relation to farm to fork and the eu biodiversity strategy we've seen the draft programme for government where there's going to be an increased emphasis on retaining existing habitats and retaining biodiversity habitats on farmland from 5% or 7% or 10% as they say in the EU strategy. So 10% of a farm will be dedicated to habitats for biodiversity such as hedgerows and once we retain these habitats and you have the quantity of habitat then you can start focusing on the quality. So future CAP or future agri-environment schemes can include results-based payments to improve the quality of the habitats that farmers have. John, a really interesting insight there and in some of the work that's going on down in the Bride uh, project in terms of uh, habitats and, and maintaining and, and enhancing those habitats. Um, there's a lot of talk recently about results-based payments uh, and how they're going to be the future as well, but also about you know in, in enhancing habitats and the level of habitats in Irish farms. Maybe explain a little bit about that. Yeah, so you know, on Irish farmland, uh, we see that, and on beef farms in particular, some of our work uh, that's looking at the more more intensively managed beef farms in a sa in a sample that we had recently uh, in the study, uh, is showing that you know there's about eight percent of those farms is is comprised of habitats, wildlife habitats. That's everything from hedgerows to ditches, buffer uh, areas, um, but also you know about half of that is is comprised of habitats that are considered ineligible habitats. And I think this is something that the next, uh, with the focus on biodiversity and farm to fork, the new EU biodiversity strategy, and also the um, EU Court of Auditors uh, recent report about, about cap payments and how they do or don't uh, uh, stimulate biodiversity conservation. You know, th this, this idea that there are habitats that are effectively seen as um, it's all, there's almost a financial penalty for having these habitats on the farm and that they're ineligible for payment. So I think this is going to be um, something that will be closely looked at in the next cap and will be quite interesting, especially in light of the requirement or the, the strategy and, and, the, and the value of 10% of a high diversity landscape feature being discussed. You know, to attain that kind of level, um, it, would seem, it would seem illogical not to recognise those other habitats that also have quite significant wildlife value. In terms of results-based approaches, um, it is, yeah, th these are really featuring an awful lot at the moment and considered a really deep green approach um, for achieving environmental objectives. I guess looking at the, you know, it might, might help to compare how other, other approaches that differ from results-based um, uh, tackle things. You know, this example here, we can see three different examples of, of grassland, which would vary in their ecological quality from, you know, very low species richness in the bottom example to a, a very species rich uh, grassland with lots of orchids in it uh, at the top. And in a traditional approach, once you attained a certain eligibility criteria, you get the same flat rate payment, no matter what was the quality. So the, the second and the third one will get the same payment. In a results-based approach, in contrast, um, there's a performance-related uh, payment. And this means that farmers who have an existing habitat with very high quality get a higher payment. But it also means that those farmers who have a medium level of habitat quality can be incentivized and rewarded for, for achieving a higher level of quality. So this is a key feature of the results-based approach. Uh, we've got another example, just very quickly showing how you know, a results-based approach can help with hydro quality. In the bottom example here, we've got a, a quite poor example of hydro quality. And in contrast, again, from our colleagues in the Bride Project, Lone for Moy, we've got an example of a really nice hydro with great structure and flowering that would really benefit pollinators, birds, small mammals, and, and other beneficial insects. And again, the, the idea here is that the payments can be structured to reward farmers and habitats that deliver greater quality. You know, results-based approaches don't mean that all of the payment has to be dedicated to a results-based approach in this way. And Ireland has been leading the way in, in the last decade or so in developing results-based approaches. And what we see in many of these projects and programs is a blend where the traditional action-based approach, where you're, you're paid for the action and not necessarily in the outcome, is blended in with performance-related approaches. Um, so this looks like, it, you know, it's not going to be one or the other, and a hybrid approach is likely to be the, the approach of the future. But again, the, the importance of results-based payments is how they reward existing high levels of performance and also incentivize trying to achieve that high level. Okay. No, it's, it's certainly the way the 
policy focus on the environment and biodiversity, I think we're going to see more and more of these results-based payment schemes uh, coming into Ireland. But encouragingly, as you said, Ireland has actually really led the way in s- developing some of these very successful schemes. When you think of the burn, you think of the bride project, um, you know, there's win-wins there for the farmer, for the environment, for biodiversity. So it's great that we're, we're you know, as I said, leading the way in, in, in terms of a lot of the development of these schemes. Um, John, thank you for your time. It's been a really interesting discussion on biodiversity on Irish farms and habitats. And I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be a key focus for farmers over the next four to five years as, as, uh, with, the, with the focus of our new government. So thanks for joining us. OK, some really interesting insights there from Dr. John Finn of Chagas Johnstown Castle and uh, a couple of really interesting videos about the number, uh, different number of uh, uh, different initiatives that are taking place on Irish farms in terms of improving biodiversity on our farmland. Now we're going to go back and, and talk to about greenhouse gas emissions again, specifically around methane. And uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Sinead Waters, Principal Research Officer here at Chagas Grains. Um, Sinead, you know, we hear a lot about methane emissions uh, and most of them in Ireland produced by cattle. Why is it such a big problem uh, for, for in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Well, Larkin, uh, methane is a greenhouse gas. Um, it is 28 times more potent than, than carbon dioxide. Um, so its uh, sources in agriculture in Ireland is generally enteric fermentation or what we call methane that's emitted during feed digestion. Uh, so being a pasture-based country here in Ireland with, uh, with livestock, you know, we produce lots of methane. Another source of methane is stored manure and slurry. Um, so 60% of our methane that's produced uh, is from agriculture. So that's a massive number. Um, so if we want to enhance sustainability uh, and reduce global warming and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reducing methane will be key to meeting our EU targets uh, on climate change. Mm-hmm. Uh- so as you said, it's a, it's a very significant greenhouse gas. How are we going to reduce that, that gas? What, what, what do you think is uh, the solutions to reducing methane emissions? Yeah, so there's a number of uh, uh, research initiatives ongoing, a lot of research ongoing uh, with ourselves in Chagask and other institutions, as well as ICBF, the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. Uh, the first one is breeding initiatives. So we're working uh, together with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation to uh, produce and generate cattle that essentially emit, have a lower environmental output and emit less uh, greenhouse gases, including methane. Uh, so we have a lot of work going on in the Tully Irish Cattle Breeding Federation Centre for where we can actually uh, do some research where we can actually link the animal's genome or its genetic material to the methane that it's actually producing. So that, that work is ongoing and it's funded nationally through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines and also internationally through EU funding. Uh, also another uh, strategy would be to feed uh, additives, uh, be it for uh, additives to feed the animal to reduce methane emissions from enteric fermentation through the feed uh, and also to add to stored manures and slurry to reduce methane emissions from that source also. So we have a number of projects in that area ongoing and that's another um, option that will be, will be a possible promising future for us. Uh, another area that is promising is for multi-species swords, such as for example if you have clover uh, in your sward, that there is research from Canada and other parts of the world where they can show that um, there's a tendency towards reduced methane emissions from animals fed uh, pasture where there's actually clover included in the diet. Okay. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, feed additives there mm. and potential solutions to you know, stopping or reducing methane in, in cattle. Um, th- we've heard a lot more talk about this kind of thing mm-hmm. over the last number of years. Maybe give us an example. What are some of the feed additives you're looking at and maybe what are the issues associated with those feed additives in terms of as a feed to cattle? Yeah, so it's very promising. It's very exciting. We see a lot uh, in the media and in the newspapers about different feed additives. Um, Some of them are, for example, seaweeds. We see a lot where they can reduce methane emissions quite significantly. Um, Also, 3NOP or 3NOP, which is produced by a company called DSM in Switzerland. And that, from the literature, can show us that if they feed beef cattle or dairy cattle, they can reduce uh, methane emissions for up to 30%. Um, Also, there's some oils that are looking quite promising, such as Mutral and Agalin. And we have a new project that's just been funded uh, through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines called Methabate. Uh, And this project is really on trying to develop novel um, strategies, uh, novel technologies to reduce methane emissions from agriculture, be it from from basically feed and from from feed digestion and also from from slurries and, and manures. Uh, the feed additives we're looking in that project are the 3NOP, 
the seaweeds um, and the oils and halides. Um, and things that we're going to look at, it's just not, you simply can't just you know, feed the additive uh, and have your reduced meat in it, that's your answer. That's not sufficient. We need to ensure that feeding the additives does not have any negative effects on production. Uh, we need to ensure that it can be delivered at pasture. We're a pasture-based country. Um, so we need to try and develop for effective additives can be delivered, be delivered in a bolus form, for example, or can they be encapsulated so we can feed them at pasture. Uh, another thing to consider, and this is particularly true for, for additives like seaweeds, if they are actually um, you know, shown to be effective at reducing methane emissions, is that there's no toxic effects or any, any um, harm to the nutritional value of our resultant meat or milk products. So that would be critically important. Mm -hmm. So we're going to evaluate that in, in our project. Uh, another thing is it has to be cost effective. There's no point in, in having a, um, a product or an additive that, uh, that, you, that's not, that you cannot actually purchase, that's too expensive for the farmer or for our industry in general. So um, we will be looking at uh, farm level cost effectiveness through the National Farm Survey. Another option thing to consider as well is that it's sustainable. And that's something that actually comes into effect when, when, you, when you think about seaweed. We need to be able to produce sufficient amount of the product sustainably. Uh, and that that in itself doesn't have any negative implications for our environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's some really promising research yeah. going on there, uh, potentially around uh, solutions to methane emissions uh, mm -hmm. from cattle. Um, you know, if farmers are going to have to feed these additives, is there a question of, you know, is reducing the, that methane uh, going to influence profitability on farms? Well, yeah, and that's critically important, Lorcan. That's, that's absolutely critically important. We know that reducing, uh, say, methane emissions, um, that there, there is a potential for increased profitability when you consider that methane production in itself um, is a, an energetically wasteful process. So for the, for the room and microbes to produce uh, methane emissions, uh, it's basically a way that, that that energy should be better used towards production. Uh, so we know that we can waste up between 2 and 12 percent of the energy intake from the animal can be wasted on methane emissions. So that's the first line where you can see that there's actually, it's wasteful while producing methane emissions. But we have a large project uh, ongoing uh, with our collaborators, the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation in Tully, which I mentioned earlier. And we have put, uh, analyzed uh, methane in you know, hundreds of animals actually. Uh, and even from that, those studies alone, uh, we can see that there is a, say a negative correlation between the, the index. So the lower methane uh, emission animals have a higher breeding index, a terminal index or a placement index. So really what we're saying there is animals that have low methane yield uh, have a higher, uh, higher ranking in the replacement index. So that's very exciting for us uh, in terms of, of the new work that's coming out of Tully in relation to methane emissions. Yeah, it's great to hear that. And mm. it's great to see Ireland leading in, in this area because it's such a critical part of our um, our, our agriculture sector here Absolutely. in Ireland, cattle production. Um, you mentioned Tully Research Station and the work that's going on there uh, in terms of uh, trials with new methane additives. Uh, we now have, now have a short video where Adam Woods caught up with Dr. Stephen Conroy and Paul Smith in Tully Research Station to get a flavour of what's going on there and, and how uh, this is, you know, what results it may bring for farmers. Stephen, we're here in the Gene Ireland Progeny Test Centre in Tully, County Kildare. Tell me a little bit about what happens here in the sheds behind us. Well, Adam, this is uh, one of three main sheds we have at the facility. Uh, we have a throughput of about 750 animals annually. It's, a, it's an all-indoor system. And what we're trying to do here is uh, collect information on progeny uh, from AI sires of interest. So these are AI sires that are widely used in the industry, as, long as, as well as new AI sires that are coming through. So what happens is uh, all these animals are sourced directly from farms, uh, 20, 20 progeny per sire uh, in the form of heifer steers and bulls. We purchase these animals about four months prior to slaughter. And when the animals come in, they go on a 30 day acclimatization period. And when they get used to their diet and used to their environment, and then we put them on a 90 day performance test. And what happens in that is we weigh the animals every few weeks uh, to see their live weight gain. But really what we do at Tully that's quite different that we can't do in an on-farm environment is we look to record hard to record and expensive traits. So those uh, three main traits are feed intake. So you can see the feed intake uh, system around us. It's an instant hex system. So that records uh, throughout the day what the animals are eating. Then we also record methane. So we have six green feed uh, 
boxes on site here at the moment, and that measures the methane output of these animals. And we also then, when these animals are slaughtered at the end of their 120 days on site here, then we collect meat quality data. So that's meat eating quality and for tenderness, juiciness and flavour, but it's also meat yield, where we look at 19 individual cuts of meat in the carcass and we evaluate that. And the whole idea is to gather this information some of it's in the current terminal and replacement indexes, such as feed intake, but we're also looking at future traits, likes of methane, likes of meat eating quality that we see coming down the line uh, for farmers. And all that goes into the evaluation and feeds into the indexes. As I said, feed intake is currently feeding into the index, and that's increasing the reliability uh, behind the sires out there in the industry. And I suppose importantly to mention as well that not only uh, do we collect data on these animals when they're in Tully, but this data is collected on farm, so throughout their lifetime, from birth right through to slaughter. Why are, are more profitable farms producing less methane? Well, I suppose there's a number of factors related to it. And if you, if you look at the, 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 the larger methane picture, uh, one of the key things is age at slaughter. So those farmers would have been using good grass utilisation, um, so they would have been ensuring the animals were doing good live weight gains throughout their lifetime and getting to a slaughter age much younger, because really uh, age of slaughter is one of the key ways we can reduce methane output in the lifetime of an animal. More importantly, when we look at the national suckler herd, over 900,000 cows at the moment, uh, the higher index cows are producing uh, less methane uh, by up to uh, just over half a percent. So that's a really good story for the industry. So, so the current direction we're going in is, is helping us in terms of methane yes. emissions? Yes, so the average, the average suckler cow had a replacement index in 2015 at the start of BDGP of 78 euro. That's now 100 euro in 2020. We've gone from a four euro increase uh, in genetic gain annually up to seven euros this year. So back in 2015, it was four euro. So we hope to increase that year on year and get that then up to a reduction of 1% uh, annually per cow in terms of greenhouse gases. Over 10 years, that's 10%. So when you look at breeding, we can look at over a 10-year period of achieving a 10% reduction. So Paul, Stephen talked to us about methane and I guess the work that's going on here in Tully. Tell me a little bit about how you measure methane, how, how you physically do that with cattle. Okay, Adam, so there's three different ways that you can measure methane. Yeah, you can put them in respiration chambers, where you measure, you put the animal in a chamber and you measure all the gases they produce. You can use the SF6 method, whereby you put a bolus within their stomach and they release um, SF6 gas, and we can use that to estimate methane production. And then the system that we use here in, uh, in Tully is the green feed system. So that's a, a machine that's brought in from the States. And basically the way that machine works is each animal is fitted with uh, an RFID tag within their ear. And so when the animal approaches the machine, a piece of bait feed is dropped for the animal. So roughly about 30 grams every 30 seconds is dropped for the animal. The idea obviously that it's entice the animals to use the machine. So while the animal's sitting there, while the animal's standing at the machine and consuming the feed, um, an extractor fan up the top of the unit will suck all the air surrounding the animal's head and we'll bring it into the machine, pass it by sensors, and then we're able to get a, an accurate estimation of um, the animal's methane output. Stephen talked about three different ways of reducing methane emissions. Reduce livestock numbers, mm -hmm. uh, we say use dietary supplements, or, or change the feed that we feed to animals, or use breeding. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, is the, is the most, I guess, beneficial way to reduce methane emissions, or is it a combination of each of those three? So as you said, it's, it's a combination of, um, of, of, well, it's a combination of, uh, of dietary means and of breeding and um, so the idea would be that while we can breed animals to produce less methane that's obviously going to be a long-term strategy so in the in the meantime while we're trying to decrease the, the methane going down the breeding route we can be and um, we can look at dietary supplementation or as I said increasing and um, the quality of grass that animals are feeding or, or increasing maybe a little bit of concentrate that the animal is eating and also we can look at supplements for the diet so there is supplements out there on the market or they're in sorry not in the market but are getting tested and um, a supplement called tree nitro oxypropanol and that has been shown to reduce methane output by nearly up to 60% in some studies. So that's obviously it's a bit of research that's going on at the moment. Then research is starting in supplementation strategies uh, in Chagas Grange uh, and Chagas Atom Roy with uh, Sinead Waters on Metabate is the project. Um, so that will be looking at supplementation strategies. And then we can also look at maybe supplementing fat to the animals. Um, but again, that's a little bit of a tricky, a tricky avenue to go down because the more fat that you feed the animal, that can tend to impact um, fibre digestion. So it's kind of just trying to get the balance right then. So if you put fat into the diet, try and decrease methane, Team, but also not having that negative effect on, uh, on fibre digestion. Okay, Paul, it's not simple. Thanks very no. much. <laughs>
Okay, so that was just a, a, an interesting video there, some of the work that's going on at Tully Research Station between the ICBF and Chagas in terms of lowering our methane emissions. Um, I just before we kind of wrap up, I, I want to get the thoughts for my two panelists uh, here today. Um, you know, we've seen uh, we have a new government now in Ireland. We've got a green influence government. We have a new program for government which has set out a stall for Irish agriculture over the next five years, which is certainly going to be a shift in emphasis on our policy and where we're headed and our, what we have to do to tackle our emissions and also biodiversity. Uh, Paul, come to you. What's your thoughts on where things are going? I mean, I, I would safe to say that Chagas are going to be at the forefront of a lot of this work that's going to have to happen? Yeah, I suppose, Larkin, really it's reflecting the direction of travel for some time. You know, if we look back, uh, even going back to the beginning of BDGP, that, that was, and before that, of course, but let's take BDGP as an example, that is ostensibly an environmental program. You know, the, object, the objectives of BDGP is to, re, to, to breed a more carbon efficient animal. Uh, so, so the direction of travel has been very clear. Uh, again, if we look at uh, prior to the government formation, we had the EU Commission releasing the proposals for the next cap, farm to fork and the biodiversity proposals, and both of those give clear indication for where support payments will go. Currently, we have BPS, which is based on you know, payments received in 2003 and historically activities on the farm in 2001. Realistically, will the consumer, you know, the general member of the public, uh, support payments to farmers based on what the farmers did 20 years ago? Probably not. We're going to struggle to make that argument. Uh, I think there will be much stronger argument underpinning uh, the whole biodiversity, carbon efficiency story. Um, so the direction of travel, as I say, has been in that, in, in that way for some time. I suppose the new government and the government formation will accelerate that. Um, clearly, there's going to be a greater emphasis on you know, the environmental credentials of our, of our, in this case, beef production systems, but agriculture in general. Um, we have seen from the uh, biodiversity uh, interviews and videos we've seen here uh, today, uh, we, we've seen from the data around methane, the data around general greenhouse gas emissions, that we have a positive story to tell. Uh, but of course, that won't be enough. You know, it's the, it's the old uh, adage of, you know, measure, show and then improve. You know, mm -hmm. we have to have systems to verify what we're doing. And we also have to have research to improve, whether it be greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to improve um, our, our, you know, securing of biodiversity uh, on farms, reducing, we didn't speak about ammonia very much, but, you know, that clearly is another uh, topic that we, we have to address and we have... Uh, post today that uh, on social media, which will highlight the work on ammonia that we're carrying out. Water quality, we have the ASAP program, which has been extremely successful. So there are a very wide range of topics. And as I say, I think we have a good story. I know we have a good story to tell based on the evidence, uh, but it's never enough to show you're doing well. We have to continuously mm -hmm. improve. And, you know, as you said, a much more accelerated focus on kind of environment and biodiversity in our agricultural policy going forward. Do you think, Paul, we can have both? Can you have production, agriculture, and good environmental stewardship and biodiversity, rich biodiversities uh, on farms? Can, can you have both? Or are they I, mutually exclusive? Yeah, I, I think you can. There, there are some circumstances where, um, you know, it might add an additional cost. So maybe meeting some particular uh, uh, environmental or sustainability credentials uh, may require additional uh, cost imposed on the farm. Uh, if it's biodiversity, for example, do you have to, um, I, you know, set aside some part of your farm for biodiversity purposes? And that, of course, reduces the amount of land available for what we might call, you know, traditional production agriculture. Uh, but that aside, I think, by and large, both of them can be very complementary. And it's, it's, it's what's termed indirect efficiency or indirect measures to improve uh, environmental performance. So the whole areas of breeding more efficient animals, that is a win-win because you're breeding animals to calve earlier. You don't have that overhead of emissions, that environmental overhead of an additional six months or whatever it is to calve down. Uh, in particular, uh, a topic that we're very focused on at the moment is age at slaughter. On average, in our target systems, we're slaughtering at 22, 23 months of age. Uh, as opposed to 28, 29 months of age on average for the country. Uh, so that's six month dif differential in age at slaughter uh, and there's no reduction in carcass weight. So in both cases, killing at about 390 to 400 kilos carcass. So I think there are very substantial win-wins available where you can have complementary improvements in sustainability uh, as well as improvements in product productivity of agriculture. Okay. 
Sinead, from your perspective, you're at the forefront of research here in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and, and methane and those kind of things. Um, from where you sit today, uh, like, are the reductions, maybe the targets that farmers are going to be set for greenhouse gas emissions, are they achievable? How do you feel about the research and where it's headed? Yeah, are you I, optimistic? I, yes, Lorcan, I'm very excited about the research. I think if you have a combination of some of the solutions that I spoke about earlier, um, if you have the breeding initiatives, we're seeing really promising data coming out of Tully. Um, if you have that and you have good genetics on your farm, if you have that combined with, say, a successful feed additive that I'm hoping to get from this Methabate project and that that can be implemented across the farms in Ireland, as well as you know, multi-species sward, if we can see reductions in, in that area. I think if you have a combination of those together, we certainly will see what you know, the targets of 7% annually that they're looking for in greenhouse gas emissions. But particularly in methane, uh, I think it is achievable. I'd be hoping it would be achievable. Um, and if you look at you know, our Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines has invested in the last funding call um, quite heavily in the environment. That was one of the main calls, topics, and we were, we were actually lucky to be successful here in Grange in getting one of those, those grants to do this research. Uh, and I think they're taking us seriously, you know, finally in the whole area of the environment. And with also now a new kind of super junior minister in, in Deputy Pippa Hackett, uh, when, when she comes into fold as well for land use and biodiversity, I think that can only add to, you know, add to, to basically uh, to success in that area hopefully if we can show as well it's all about demonstration I think um, and look at from the data coming from Tully and from ourselves uh, you know if we can show to farmers that by reducing methane emissions it is possible on your farm and it will also enhance your profitability of your farm uh, I think that's a win-win situation it's about engagement with, with the farming community um, and and demonstrating okay. really. uh, and do you think I mean I suppose the greatest challenge for a lot of the work that you're doing in terms of your research is time Yes. There's a there's a you know a need for speed I think in terms of our battle against climate change. I mean, mm -hmm. will you get that time to 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 you know fully explore and uh, develop solutions for climate change? Yeah, we're we're starting on them already. The work the work in breeding is underway. Um, I know it is time consuming, but I, I think hopefully we will have you know, something by before 2025 anyway, or even sooner. Um, so we have to go through the various motions. You can't just get a feed additive out there. We have to make sure it's fully tested, that it doesn't affect production, it's non-toxic. So there is there is a process we have to go through, and it's the same with, with breeding. So I think we're, we're well underway. We have very, you know, good scientists working in this country in these areas. Um, so I would be optimistic. Okay, well, that's a great point to finish on, a good optimistic point uh, that, you know, agriculture, production agriculture does have a, fo uh, a future in this country, but it also can play its part in terms of meeting its climate change targets. And I think that's what, when you have farmers understand that, you, you'll certainly get buy-in in terms of meeting new goals. Uh, I'd like to thank my guests, um, Dr. Paul Crossan, Professor Sinead Waters, and we were also joined by Dr. John Finn. Um, it's been a really engaging and, and an interesting discussion. Uh, I just remind our, our, our viewers, don't forget, uh, tomorrow show where Adam Woods will uh, be talking to Terry Carroll, Mark McGee and Catherine Egan about grassland management and nutrition. You can tune in at 12pm on farmersjournal.ie and chagas.ie. Thank you.